I'm Claude Baraby, director of the United States Naval Academy Museum, the oldest Navy museum in the country. I was also a commander in the Navy Reserve, and I'm also a lifelong Trekkie. In Star Trek Picard Season 3, Episode 6, titled The Bounty, viewers are visually introduced to Starfleet's Fleet Museum. Because of my experience running this museum for the past decade, I was asked to provide some comments on what we saw in this episode. Now, I should note that it isn't unprecedented for the Naval Academy Museum to discuss science fiction. In November 2017, for example, the museum hosted its first NavyCon with the intent to explain contemporary Navy missions, operations, platforms, and activities through the lens of science fiction. Some of our speakers included science fiction author David Weber, creator of the Honor Harrington series, NASA astronaut Captain Kay Heyer, Congressman Mike Gallagher, Navy reporter David Larder, Commander of NSWC Carterock Captain Mark Vandroff, Navalist Dr. Jerry Hendricks, and others. So let's get into the meat and bones of this episode where the USS Titan A goes to the Fleet Museum. First, the Fleet Museum consists of dozens of ships moored to a space dock around the planet Athen Prime. When I, when I first heard Athen Prime, I wasn't sure if I misunderstood and wondered if the writers had visited the historic Marine Barracks, the oldest post of the Corps, located in Washington, D.C. at Eighth and I. Uh, but that's a minor issue. Second, how important is Starfleet's history to Federation officials? Upon first reflection, you'd think that historic ships hold some value to Federation politicians because they're willing to invest in such a museum. However, look at the location. A military museum is best in proximity to the policymakers, since military services want to show their services historical value to the nation, or in this case, to the Federation. For example, the National Museum of the United States Army is located at Fort Belvoir, 18 miles from D.C. The National Museum of the Marine Corps is 33 miles from D.C., but can't be missed given its prominence right off of I-95 to millions of commuters and travelers. The National Museum of the United States Navy is less than two miles to the Capitol building. The same is true of other museums on the Washington Mall. When in Star Trek's canonical history do we hear of Eighth and Prime? How significant is its population or political influence if Athen Prime has never been mentioned before, much like Andoria, Vulcan, or Teller Prime? It would have made much more sense to have the Fleet Museum in the Sol system near Earth, which has easy access to policymakers, as well as representatives from every Federation planet, as well as ambassadors or visitors from other civilizations. I don't think the Federation wants the general public to have a better familiarity with Starfleet's history, and there may be two reasons for this. First, we can't assume the Federation wants support for a lot of ships in Starfleet. There may be some evidence with this in the Enterprise 1701A, which we see at the Fleet Museum. But remember, the 1701A was only in commission for less than a decade, the reason being peace with the Klingon Empire, even though Starfleet ships, especially the Enterprise, had a broader mission to seek out new life and civilizations. Now. To counter that, you might argue, well, we, do, we have had ships in the United States Navy, which, like the Iowa-class battleships, which were commissioned, decommissioned, recommissioned, re-decommissioned, and then commissioned uh, a third time in the 1980s. The second reason I say this is because the Fleet Museum is in the history field, and we really don't know if the Federation or even Starfleet value history and heritage. We're introduced to the activities of two historians in the old series. First was Professor John Gill from Starfleet Academy, who went from the kindest, gentlest man James Kirk ever knew to leader of a Nazi party on the planet Ecos. Second was Lieutenant Marla McGivers, or McGivers, if you're Kirk or Khan pronouncing it, the ship historian aboard Enterprise 1701, who went from creating artwork about historical dictators to helping Khan take over the ship. So the question is, does Starfleet actually have concerns about uh, folks who are in history. There's another issue about location, and that is visitorship, an important function of museums. The U.S. Naval Academy Museum, for example, welcomes on average more than 100,000 visitors annually from the more than 1 million that visit the Academy itself annually. It's possible that Athen Prime has a large population or is a trade hub, but again, we don't have any canonical evidence of that. In addition, in this episode, we don't see ships or shuttles conveying those visitors. Now, we could argue that they may be in transporter range of the planet, but again, we don't see any general planet traffic in the background. And there's a reason why all the Smithsonian museums are at the center of Washington, D.C., because it makes it very convenient for tourists. 
It's possible that either through holodecks or some other technology, people throughout the Federation and beyond can visit the facility virtually. We haven't fully developed that capability at the museum, but we are working on a couple of things. We do provide a 3D tour for virtually for visitors, and we're also starting the planning phases of our first exhibit using holograms. The next issue is with the facility itself. No pun intended, but this has a lot of wasted space. Space with any museum, even historic ships, are at a premium. Our museum has about 60,000 items in its collection, but we only have the space to display about 1,500 items. I think that's consistent with a lot of other museums. Now that's a benefit for this fleet museum. If this is also a primary storage area, that space dock provides ample storage. The same goes for the likely exhibit galleries you'd see aboard. But the design for the fleet museum really doesn't work. Each museum has a design flow for visitors, not unlike, but not as focused, as how IKEA guides you through their stores. Visitors generally have a couple of hours when they visit a museum, so that's why the exhibits and space have to be conveniently outlaid. Given the size of the ships on display at the Fleet Museum and the Space Dock, this isn't a convenient design for visitors to walk around to reach each ship, which may be kilometers from each other. Again, we could argue that transporters can move visitors from one ship to another, but again, you're still walking around multiple decks on each ship, and that takes time. A better design might have been something like Deep Space Nine's pylons to keep the ships themselves closer to the main hub. This facility is also a maintenance nightmare, and while I know the economy of the future is different, no resource is infinite. Things need to be repaired and maintained by a full-time staff, otherwise why would Chief O'Brien do the work instead of an army of repair androids? Normally historic ships have a lot of problems. They're old, their materials deteriorate, and they never ever function like they did when they were in service. Let's think about the basic maintenance needs on any of the historic ships at Starfleet's Fleet Museum. If those starships have visitors, they'll need essentials like an atmosphere, restrooms, water and food access, transporters if applicable. Museums like ours are required to have conditions like constant temperature and humidity to preserve our artifacts such as especially paper and textiles. You'd have security cameras and motion sensors, technology to track visitors for visitor counts. I also think what I believe are combined mooring and observation rings around each starship is a wasted and unnecessary expenditure of resources. If you calculate the amount of metal and other materials required for those rings alone, that's probably similar to the total mass of building another starship. We do know that during the Dominion War, Starfleet had trouble building ships fast enough to keep up with losses. So it doesn't make sense from a design standpoint to expend those resources on a museum that could be easily used for a starship or a merchant ship or whatever else you need to actually explore the galaxy. Very few historic ships have some sort of dry dock unless it's absolutely necessary to preserve the ships. The two off the top of my head are HMS Victory in Portsmouth, UK, the oldest commissioned warship in the world, or the submarine USS Albacore, which coincidentally is also in a Portsmouth, but Portsmouth, New Hampshire in the United States. Those are both exposed to the elements. A third, the World War II German submarine U-505, is entirely within the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Another issue with this museum is that it's apparently operated by Starfleet, which is extremely unusual. If you were to visit nearly every historic ship in the United States, you'd find them run by private entities who have agreed to the United States Navy that they would manage them appropriately like Admiral Dewey's flagship Olympia in Philadelphia at the Independence Seaport Museum. An exception is the USS Constitution in Boston, the oldest commissioned warship afloat in the world. Going back to an earlier assessment, does this mean that Starfleet actually values its heritage? Not necessarily. It may just mean that there aren't people in the Federation economy who have the private means or benevolent intent to preserve historic ships. So think about people like Kivas Fajo, who we saw who had the means but not necessarily benevolent intent. So it really defaults to Starfleet to maintain historic ships. We also see two Klingon warships as well as a Romulan. This should raise a red flag. Owning and displaying foreign artifacts or ships can be extremely contentious. How do the Klingons and Romulans feel about what we can assume are captured ships on display? We in the United States might ask how we feel about the USS Pueblo on display as a museum ship in North Korea. It's possible that the Klingons donated the Katinga-class ship, but certainly the bounty bird of prey taken by Kirk 
it was probably a source of embarrassment to a lot of Klingons. At the Naval Academy, in reality, we had a Spanish unprotected cruiser taken during the Spanish-American War. We, it had sunk and we eventually raised it. From 1912 until the late 1950s, the Reina Mercedes was based at the United States Naval Academy, serving as a place for sailors to live, as well as for midshipmen behaving badly to be sent to as a sort of part-time brig. In 1954, the Spanish government attempted to repatriate the Reina Mercedes. Although that was unsuccessful, the U.S. government scrapped it just a few years later. Also, it's unlikely that the bounty had a workable, century-old cloaking device. More likely, the device was gutted, and only its shell was on display. The same is true for historic ships of the U.S. Navy or Coast Guard. Contrary to the myth generated by the movie Battleship, you can't just rev up the warp engines and assume you have weapons and operating systems available. We also see an interesting choice as director of the Fleet Museum with Commodore Geordi LaForge. There's no indication that he's a retired Commodore, especially since he's still wearing the uniform of Starfleet. The directors of Naval History and Heritage Command here in the United States, for example, have often been retired naval op officers, one exception being Captain Jerry Hendricks, who served there on active duty from 2012 to 2014. Within the Naval History and Heritage Command museums across the country, the National Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola has a retired Navy captain as its director. The only Navy museum that consistently has an active duty officer is, as director is the Submarine Force Library and Museum in Groton, Connecticut. And in my case, I've served as both an active duty officer and a civilian in charge of the Naval Academy Museum, although one of my predecessors served as an active duty captain, later retired admiral as director. We know Jordi LaForge has had at least some interest in naval heritage, such as when he built a model of HMS Victory for his previous captain aboard USS Victory. But his talents as an engineer are wasted here, since he doesn't, isn't designing anything new or improving something. He's managing a shore command. And we don't know if he's written any history or star of Starfleet or the ships, but if his exchange with his daughter Sydney is an indication, maybe he just wanted a nice quiet out of the way job, presumably as his final assignment in Starfleet. Now from a user standpoint, I think Commander Seven's armchair keypad to access information and cameras on the ships themselves was a really nice touch. Some museums have publicly available databases and several years ago, uh, we at the Naval Academy Museum created a 30 artifact tour using QR codes in four different languages as one way to make our museum more visitor friendly to international visitors. Okay, that's it. That's my assessment of Starfleet's Fleet Museum at Athen Prime. Thanks to the producers, writers, and actors on season three of Star Trek Picard, which has been a real tour de force. And we hope that uh, you'll comment on this video, point out something that I'm wrong on, and maybe I got something right too. And like the Fleet Museum at Athen Prime, we hope you'll visit us at the U.S. Naval Academy Museum in Annapolis someday.